Well, thank you very much to our worship team. I know it's different teams, but you guys always do such a great job leading us. Really appreciate it. So uh, they, they tell us when we're learning about preaching that it's important to connect with the audience to start with. You know, you have to, you have to find some kind of common ground. They say it's not enough just to talk about the weather or anything like that, but I really want to talk about the weather. Uh, we were out skating yesterday, and it was, it was plus eight. And uh, for a moment, I thought to myself, maybe, maybe this is it. <laughs> maybe this is spring. Like, the, the winter is over, and, and I just want to remain in that moment just for a second. <laughs> just that dream. Um, even though that would be really nice, I, I am aware that it probably wouldn't be a good thing, right? That there's, there's an ebb and flow to our our seasons, and that's important. Um, if, if we didn't have the long winter, then I'm sure some scientists could tell you what, what would go wrong, but there'd be something that would go wrong. You know, the trees wouldn't be able to, to bloom, or flowers wouldn't be able to bloom, trees wouldn't be able to have fruit, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's important. That's all I want to say about that, is that it's important that we have the different seasons. Uh, that'll make sense in a moment. Uh, we are in week two of a series called Love Song. And this is uh, based on the Song of Solomon. And I said last week, and I'll probably say it every week just so that no one goes away wondering what's going on. Uh, this is actually a sermon series that, that is based on another pastor's sermon series. A guy named Craig Rochelle out of uh, a church called Life Church, which is, which is a huge church down based out of Oklahoma. Uh, and, and I was wanting to, to preach on Song of Solomon. I said this last week. I've never preached on Song of Solomon before. I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on, on Song of Solomon. And yet it is a vitally important book for us. I mean... Solomon himself, who wrote it, says that it's, it's the greatest of all the songs, of all the psalms. And we, we study the psalms, so we need to study Song of Solomon. Uh, and so I was looking around trying to find, find out how do you break down the, uh, the sermon, uh, or break, break down the book into a sermon series, and I came across this sermon series, and I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to use that as a guideline. Uh, I'll do my own study. And th- there was a part of me who thought, this will be actually kind of easy. You know, I'm, I'm doing women's break during the week, and I can get a little help with my sermon. It's way harder. You know, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta prepare a sermon and then listen to his sermon and then try to make the two match. So it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of difficult in that way, but um, but it's good. I I'm, I'm enjoying it so far. I, I think last week was good. Uh, last week we talked about four qualities we should let God build in us to attract the right person, uh, whether that whether you're dating or married. You know, these are these are all qualities you should be uh, continuing to build. Uh, next week we're going to talk about godly sex. Uh, that that sex is something that God created for us. Uh, that, that God isn't against sex. It was actually his invention. Um, and so make sure you come next week. Uh, this week, we're talking about perfect seasoning. And that's why I was talking about the seasons. Uh, how do we pursue each other, whether you're married or dating, how do we pursue each other in every season? And we have to understand that every season has a purpose. Um, you know, there is so much emphasis on the physical pursuit. So much emphasis on, on just, just the physical side of a relationship that we forget about the emotional and spiritual side. Um, I, was, I was thinking back to my very first date. Unfortunately, it wasn't with Kathy. It was before Kathy and I were dating. My very first date was before I had a license. So I had my mom drive me to the girl's house. I walked up to the front door, rang the doorbell, you know, walked her, did, did what my dad taught me to. You open the door, you know, let her in, go around the other side, and then they dropped us off at the movies. We went to go see Aladdin. Uh, in theater, and uh, I was not so much interested in what was happening on the screen. <laughs> I was interested in what was happening right here, because I was hoping to get some hand action, just, you know, hold, hold fingers, you know, just, and so I was sitting there with my hand, I was, I was available. I wasn't, I wasn't making too much of a move, I wasn't, you know, putting my hand over on her lap or anything, I just, my hand was there. She probably thought, man, this guy's hogging the armrest, but I'm, <laughs> I'm leaving myself open, available. There's one point in the movie Aladdin where Aladdin's standing on his magic carpet and he's inviting Jasmine up to come and join him and he reaches out his hand and says, do you trust me? And for a moment I almost went, do you trust me? (laughs) To this day I still don't know if that would have been a good move or a bad move, if it would have been cheesy. I chickened out, I didn't do it. Um, I went home that night without my hand being held. Yeah, I know, poor me. all that to say, you know, as a young teenage boy, I, I was only 
very innocently at this point, just concerned about the physical side of the relationship, right? I wasn't really connecting emotionally or spiritually with this person. Um, I was too young to date, let's just say that. If you, if you don't have your license, you know, I think they're all in youth right now anyway, but if, if you don't have your license, you're probably not ready to date. Um, but the question is, how do we pursue each other in a way that honors God? You know, not just physically, but spiritually and emotionally as well. Uh, we're looking at Song of Solomon chapter 2, and, and we're going to bounce a little bit back and forth, uh, just because that, that's the way it, it, it makes sense. Starting in verse 11. If you're not married, you are going to have a season of preparation. Uh, that's just the way it is. If you're not married yet, there will be a season of preparation. Song of Solomon uh, 2 verse 11 says, Look, the winter is past, and the rains are over and gone. The flowers are springing up. The season of singing birds has come. The cooing of turtle doves fills the air. This is, this is the woman saying this. You know, she's, she's in love, right? And, and she's just saying, man, the, the winter's past, spring is over. All the, all the good things are happening. It's almost like a Disney movie, right? Where the, the princess is walking through the, the, through the woods and birds are flocking and, and all kinds of great stuff's happening. The fig trees are forming young fruit. The fragrant grapevines are blossoming. It's spring, Right? It is the time of spring, which means what? It means winter is over. Uh, their time of preparation is over. Winter is the time of preparation. And so I was saying before, you know, wouldn't it be great if this was spring now? Uh, winter is the time when, when all the good things that are going to happen are actually being prepared. This is the, this is the moment in the, season, in, the, in the year where the roots are growing deeper, right? This is the moment where, where the things are getting stronger, so that they can then flower and bloom and, and bud and, and produce fruit. The thing is with us, we, we want to be in spring, right? We don't want to be in winter. No one likes being in winter, uh, literally or figuratively speaking, right? We, we always want to be in spring. We want to see the good things that are happening. You know, if it's, it's your spiritual life, you don't want to go through the hard part, part of winter. You just want to be in spring. But winter has a purpose, and God might have you in winter by design. Uh, God might be helping you heal from hurts of the past. That might be your winter. You might say, you know what, I want to be in a relationship, but God's saying, but you're not ready to be in a relationship yet. You're still hurt. You're still holding on to some bitterness, some anger. You need to learn to forgive. You need to start healing in your soul. I mean, you're, you're almost ready to start trusting again, but you're not there. You're still in winter. Or maybe spiritually speaking, you know, your, your spiritual roots are growing deeper, getting you strong enough to be able to sustain the weight of a spiritual relationship. Uh, for some of you, it, it might be practical. You're learning, uh, you know, like me, how to actually drive a car, right? I wasn't ready at that point. Maybe you're learning how to make car payments. Maybe you're learning how to show up on time. Maybe you're learning how to, how to, to be responsible. And it's a time of preparation. You're, you're in winter. Spring is coming, but right now, God's got you in winter for a purpose, and that's not a bad thing. Remember, you can't have spring without winter. So remember that for the next couple months, you know, you can't have spring without winter. Uh, you may be in a season of preparation. Um, this is a story about Kathy now. Uh, when, actually, right before Kathy, my winter, I was, I grew up in a Christian home, and I kind of went back and forth with my faith, and there was times where I was stronger, times where I was weaker, but, but really my, my winter, relationally speaking, came when I was in my early 20s. And, and it came, I, I'm sure I've spoken about this before, I was in Europe with a buddy who, who was same situation as me, same story, grew up in a Christian home, but he had gone off the rails, and he said, you know, I just don't believe in faith anymore. And I was kind of in that in-between place. It was maybe a dangerous place for me to be, and yet I was, he and I were, as we're backpacking through Europe, we're having these conversations about, about faith. And, and I was, you know, defending Christianity, and he was sort of attacking Christianity, and it was in that moment where I wasn't even sure what I believed, but I was in winter, and God was, was, was actually helping me to dig deep and, real, and, and understand what it was I really believed. Um, up until that point, you know, I was always looking for a girlfriend, but there was a time where I said, you know what, I, I, I can't focus on that right now. I really need to focus on my spiritual health. I need to really understand what it is I do believe. And it was at that moment when I, when I finally got serious about my faith, where I finally realized that, what, what, that I did believe what my parents always taught me about God that was true for myself. That was the moment that God brought Kathy back into my life. I mean, we'd known each other since we were kids, but, but you know, I, I grew up, she grew up, I literally grew taller, which didn't hurt. 
and uh, and that's that's when we started dating, and that's but it, but it started with a friendship. We actually just started being friends, and then we we became dating. And I mean that was my winter, and and it led into a spring. Um, if you're in winter, embrace it. Embrace the season of winter because remember you can't have spring without winter. If you're not married yet, uh, you will have a season of preparation. You may have a season of, of infatuation when you start dating. Once again, I got to work on my font. I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> this happens like, almost every week. I can't figure it out. You meet someone, and they're perfect in every single way, right? It's just like your heart goes pitter patter. Their voice speaks, and you just say, "Oh, everything about them is perfect." All the love songs on the radio start, finally start to make sense, right? You go to the the, the store, and you see all the the cards, and you want to buy them all because they're all so true. This is what's happening in verse 8. Ah, this is her again. I hear my lover coming. He's leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My lover is like a swift gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he is behind the wall, looking through the window, peering into the room. My lover said to me, rise up, my darling. Come away with me, my fair one. Now, depending on the context, that could be really creepy, right? <laughs> but she's not creeped out. He's playing peekaboo and she's into it, right? He's like saying, I see you there. And I'm over here. It's the cutesy kind of things that, that play out really well during the time of infatuation, which, which may not play out in any other time. Uh, there are things you can do in the season that you can't do later. Um, I remember, you know, when, when we were dating and we'd be together all night. Not, sorry, <laughs> I should back that up. <laughs> We'd be together all evening. And then it would be time to say goodnight, you know, and, and we would kiss each other goodnight in the driveway. And for some reason, that would take, you know, 10 minutes, you know, to say goodnight. Not, not that we were constantly making out, but it's just, you know, we didn't want to say goodbye. And then she would be pulling out of the driveway and say, call me when you get home. Or she would say to me, or I'd say, I'll call you when I get home. And it was just this, this silly, like, can you imagine that now? i say, okay, bye, hon, love you. I love you, I love you. You know, we're, take 10 minutes to leave the house and then she says, call me when you get to work. <laughs> it just doesn't happen anymore, right? <laughs> I mean, we'll call each other during the day or we'll text or something like that, but it's, I mean, the season of infatuation, we're not there anymore. Um, I remember buying Kathy roses, a dozen roses every month because it was our anniversary for the first two years. Uh, I actually had like a frequent flyer card at the rose store. <laughs> She, she dried them all out and made them into some pretty little thing. Like, it's just, it was the kind of things, you, I'm, I know I need to buy flowers more often now, but maybe not every month. I don't know if we could afford that. <laughs> but when you're young and in love and infatuation, you don't care if you can afford it. You find a way, right? Um, I wrote her poetry. It was probably really bad poetry, but I wrote her poetry. I sang her songs. I'm not much of a singer. I'm sure the songs were awful, but, you know, she, she liked it. I think she liked it. Uh, I remember her parents teasing her about me too because that's what she would say on the phone. You know, I love you, me too. And they would know that she was saying, I love you too. Um, there's been some research done on the season of infatuation and it can last one day to six months, they say. Occasionally, it might last two years. Um, but it's that moment, that, that, it's that time of your relationship where you say, it can't get any better than this problem is, is that when it doesn't get better, right? You're thinking to yourself, it can't get any better than this, and then it kind of gets worse, right? When things happen and maybe a month goes by and I don't buy flowers, or she says, yeah, don't worry about calling me when you get home. I'm, I'm sure you can drive home. You know, it's fine. When, when you move beyond that season of infatuation and you feel like, well, everything was so perfect and now it's not, I guess I'm done with that relationship. That's the problem, Right? The season of infatuation is, is there, but it's, it's, it's not meant to last. When you think to yourself, it can't get any better than this, you have to understand it can. It can get better than that. In fact, it can get infinitely better than that. It can get indescribably better. But first, it has to get real. During that season, what you feel isn't real. It's, it's, it's all emotion. 
I mean, it's not bad, but it's just, it's not real. It's not the depth of commitment of sacrificial love. If you can move beyond the everything's perfect stage to it's not perfect, but I'm willing to lay down my life for you. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to go through the good times and the bad times with you. I'm willing to, to thank God for you and also go through those times when I just have to hold on to God because he's the only thing that's going to get me through. If you can go through those times that, that you're ready to forgive each other and work through the pain that you may cause each other, if you're willing to, to seek God through all seasons, you know, for 5, 10, 25, 50 years, then it, it can get so much better than the infatuation stage. It can get infinitely better. At that point, you'll have, you'll have the, the lay down your life and love each other like Christ loves the church kind of commitment. You'll have the intimacy and spiritual friendship that, that stands the test of time. You'll have the kind of foundation that will hold up against anything. You'll have the kind of marriage that honors God if you're willing to work through those difficult times, those, those, those different times that aren't the infatuation. Now, anytime we, we do a, a series on a relationship like this, you, you run into two kind of issues. You know, do I speak to people who are dating or do I speak to people who are married? Because um, if you'd only do the, the dating sermon, half the audience is like, yeah, this isn't really for me. I, that would have been helpful 15 years ago. Uh, if you only do the married part, people who are dating will be like, yeah, someday, maybe. And so we kind of have to go back and forth. And, and I should also say that there's, there's some here who may say, God's called me to be single, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, if that's the case, and I said this last week, try and take any metaphors you can here and make it spiritual between you and God, because I think that's also appropriate. But for those who are dating and infatuated, when you're in that season of, you know, everything's great, nothing's wrong, everything's perfect, uh, you need to limit three things. You need to limit your time, your talk, and your touch. Okay? Your time. Limit your time because you're going to want to spend every waking moment with a person. Right? You're so in love. That's all you want to do. You want to spend every moment with them. You're going you're to want to cut off other relationships. Do I want to hang out with my buddies? No. No. She's so much better. You know? Or he's so much better. I don't have time for my girlfriends. I don't even want to go to work. Right? I, I just want to spend all day researching poetry. I can send Whatever. The problem is, um, your potential success as a couple is going to be based on having a spiritual community around you who will be there to support you through thick and thin. So don't cut that off. Don't, I'm not saying don't spend time with each other, just don't exclude everyone else. You know, bring her into your world, bring him into your world, um, do it together, but, but don't become that, that couple that just says we're just going to spend all our time together and everyone else is gone because uh, that's going to be difficult for you down the road. Don't abandon everything else to spend all your time with one person. Limit your talk. And, and what I mean by that is don't get too quickly into dropping the L word. Okay? Uh, there will be some people who will do this on like the first or second date. You know, I love you. Let, let's talk about our, our, ch- our children's names. And, and that's going to be enough to just scare some people away. I remember dating somebody and she was talking about, you know, I, I was talking about being a person of faith and she said, um, this is before Kathy, one of those moments where I was kind of back and forth with my faith. And, and she was like, well, that's good because our kids will need someone to, to, to lead them in that area. And I was like, oh, back the truck up. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're not there. Um, it needs to start with a spiritual friendship. Okay. That, that is the strongest foundation for a relationship. Uh, I, I love the fact that Kathy and I, we knew each other like since we were kids. Uh, I was friends with her brother and so I was over at their house all the time. So we already had that kind of relationship when we started, before we started dating, we got together again as a group of friends, and it just became a friendship that grew into something more, and I think, I think that's been so healthy for us. The longer your friendship develops, the stronger your foundation is going to be. Uh, if, you, if you speak too soon, by, by over-speaking, by saying too many, too many things too soon, you'll put too much weight on a relationship that can't sustain it. The foundation isn't there, and it'll crumble. And the last thing you need to limit is your touch. Um, this is maybe self-explanatory, but uh, it, it can be dangerous, okay? When you start touching, uh, things just start to happen. And we don't want you to be building a lustful attraction. We want to build a spiritual friendship attraction that makes the foundation solid. So if you're in this season of infatuation, limit your time, your talk, and your touch. Develop a healthy and strong foundation that will serve you well in years to come. So you're going to have a season of preparation. You may have a season of infatuation. You probably will. 
But in all seasons, whether you're dating or married, no matter what, what season you're in, do two things. First of all, in all seasons, pursue intimacy. Uh, and remember, intimacy is not romance. It's not, it's not, it's not romance. It's not flowers and heart chocolates and, and candlelit dinners and all the things that you think of. Um, you know, it's, it's not Nicholas Sparks movies. Right. I, I remember I, I wrote a thing about Nicholas Sparks a little while ago because, I mean, this is the guy who, y- you watch The Notebook, and there, there are parts of The Notebook that are probably inappropriate, but there are parts of it that are just like, 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 like Kathy never cried in a movie until we watched The Notebook, okay? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really talking a lot about Kathy this morning. Um, and she was pregnant at the time, too, so that, that probably had something to do with it. But he, the guy rose her out into this, this lake with all the swans, and it's like, I feel like, man, I should be doing something like that. <laughs> right? I mean, this, this, look at this guy. He's, he's awesome. But then I realized that lake doesn't exist. Right? Those swans don't exist. Not for real. All right? They had a handler bringing all the swans in there, making sure no animals got hurt in the making of this film. But you never have a moment where the lake is perfect with all the swans there and all the petals. That doesn't happen in real life. It only happens in the movies. And, and the reason we know that is because Nicholas Sparks, the guy who wrote that, ended up getting divorced, right? I mean, I don't take any joy in the fact that you got divorced, but you realize that that kind of thing isn't enough to, to sustain a relationship. It's not, it's not all about romance. Um, intimacy is not romance. Intimacy is transparency. Once again, with the font. Intimacy is transparency. It's, it's saying that there are no secrets between us. It's letting down the walls between you. It's, letting, it's sharing all of who you are. It's saying, this, this is me. This is every, everything that I am. Uh, love me just the way I am. It's opening your heart. It's sharing your dreams. It's sharing your fears. That's what intimacy is. Romance is a byproduct of intimacy. If you're intimate, there will be some romance, or at least there should be some romance. Uh, but, but the romance comes and goes. Intimacy is, is what, what you base your relationship on. Intimacy is the foundation that's going to hold your relationship together. And we see this in verse 14. Uh, this, this transparency, this vulnerability. The young man is saying to her, my dove is hiding behind the rocks, behind an outcrop of the, on the cliff. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is pleasant and your face is lovely. He's, he's drawing her out. I mean, she's, she's being shy, hiding. And he's saying, no, I want to I wanna see you. I want to be face to face with you. I mean, you're beautiful. You're lovely. I want to see you. I want to talk to you. Why is it that when you're dating, in this time of infatuation, why is it when you're dating you feel so close to each other? Because you're talking all the time, right? I mean, you'll be shutting out other people, or at least you'll, be, you'll have that desire to shut out other people simply so you can spend time with, with the one you're infatuated with. You talk all the time. I mean, uh, sometimes you'll have that moment. I don't know if it was true with you. I'm not sure it was true with us, but you see it all the time. People are like, okay, I, I don't want to be the one to hang up. You hang up. No, 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 you hang up. Okay, on the count of three, we'll hang up together. One, two, three. Are you still there? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and you know that's infatu- infatuation because most guys, stereotypically speaking, most guys are not going to be like that most of the time. We don't do that with our buddies. I'll just tell you that right now. <laughs> All right, we don't talk on the phone much with our buddies. Um, <laughs> And a lot of this goes back to the days before texting, right? I mean, now I'm sure it's texting all the time. But, but guys like the headlines, right? Typically speaking, guys just say, okay, just, I just want to know, how was your day? Good? Good. Women want the details. Well, what happened? Why was it a good day? Why, why, was, why was that? What went wrong? You know, I'll, give, me, give me more. Um, thing is, guys, when we're not opening up about everything, it creates... It creates a very real lack of intimacy for our wives, for our girlfriends. If you're, if you're not willing to put yourself out there, they're going to feel like cut off. I mean, for us, it may feel like that's normal. It's natural. But for our, our women, it'll feel like there's something, there's a barrier. It's break, breaking down. Um, I've heard before that, that men speak 7,000 words a day. Women speak 20,000 words a day. And so there's a 13,000 word gap that we need to fill. Um, and so that probably goes both ways. Women understand that it's, it's, it's a really difficult sometimes for the guy to bring himself out there. Guys, we need to bring ourselves out there. We need to meet in the middle somewhere. 
don't know what the math is. That's probably like 15,000 words. But understand that we, as guys, need to explain the process to our wives. Okay? And again, my wife is here in the audience. She, she could tell you. A lot of these things I'm saying are the things that I know I need to do, not the things that I am doing. All right? So I'm not putting myself on a pedestal and saying, you guys need to do this. I'm saying, we need to do this. I need to step up my game as well. Um, when we explain our process to her, when we explain how things are going, when we explain the details, then she feels intimately involved by being invited into our world. And, and that's, that's an important thing to do. Now, if we want to take this to a deeper level, we need to open up and talk about our fears. We need to talk about where we feel weak. Both men and women, we need to do this. We need to talk about where we feel vulnerable, where we feel tempted. If you really want to go deep, and I think we do, we need to ask each other to pray for each other. Pray through these areas, open and honest. When you take it to that level, then you end up having a depth of intimacy that will truly build your relationship. If you have secrets from your spouse, you will never have the intimacy that God desires for you. I'll say that again. If you have secrets from your spouse, you will never have the intimacy that God desires for you. So in all your seasons, pursue intimacy. Uh, Here's another one that I mess up at. Don't make the mistake of thinking that being close by someone is the same thing as being close to someone. Um, as a guy, I have a tendency to think that shoulder-to-shoulder time is connecting, right? What do you mean we haven't connected? We spent all, all week on the couch watching Netflix. I mean, we were there beside each other, right? We spent all this time together. How did we not connect? Uh, shoulder-to-shoulder time might work for guys. Face-to-face time is what our women need. Uh, it's what we need, too, if we're honest, if we, if we're, if we really think through it. Um, There's a big difference between being close by someone and being close to someone, and I think we mess that up a lot. We tend to think we're close because we share so many things, right? We share, uh, we share a bed, we share a house, we share food, we share a toothpaste. When we were first married, we shared a toothbrush. That's kind of weird and gross, but um, you know, you share a toilet, which is sometimes bad for her because guys don't have good aim. We share all these different things and we think, we think we're close to each other when really all we are is close by. And a lot of times we get into a rut of thinking, hey, this is, this is good, this is fine. You know, we're not fighting, we're beside each other, we're hanging out, we're shoulder to shoulder, uh, but we're not, we're not close to each other. Good news is, you can always improve. You can always improve this area and you can, you can become close to each other uh, and you can always pursue this intimacy. And it, it seems simple, but really all it is is, hey, come over here. Let's go face to face. Let's talk. Show me your face. Your voice is lovely. Your voice is sweet. All the things that he's talking to her about. Let's talk. So in every season, pursue intimacy. In every season, protect your purity. Protect your physical and sexual purity. Uh, we're going to look at verse 15. And I think we need to recognize that this is the guy saying this. Interesting thing about Song of Solomon is sometimes it's difficult in translation. Some, some translations will have different people saying different things. Um, if you actually look at the language here, it's more masculine language talking. So the guy is saying this in verse 15. So really in this area of sexual purity, the guy should take the spiritual lead. Um, I can't show you a verse that says that. I just, I, I think that's true. I believe that to be true. Um, it should be the guy who says, I want to stan- set the standard in this area. I want to take the lead. I want to protect our purity. I want to lead us closer to Christ. And that's true in our dating relationship. It's true in your marriage relationship. Verse 15. It says, Catch all the little foxes. Catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love. For the grapevines are blossoming. So what is the, what is the vineyard? The vineyard is your body. And the foxes ruin the purity of the body. So he's saying to her, Let's catch them. Let's keep them from, from eating all the fruit. Let's keep these terrible foxes from, from, from destroying the purity of our body. And again, for those who are dating somebody, if you date somebody who consistently, consistently steps over the, the grounds here in sexual purity, understand that you may be on your way to marrying somebody who does not 
fear the standard of God. All right, I'm not saying perfection. It's not like if, if you, you step over the line once, then it, well, that's it. You can't get married. I'm saying that this is a consistent issue. Then realize that, that that may be an issue in your marriage, that he just says, yeah, I know what God says, I just don't care. Or she says, I know what God says, I just don't care. Um, if every time that happens, that's an issue. Uh, it's, it's them basically saying, I'm not letting Christ take over this part of my life. Uh, and that is a dangerous foundation to build your marriage on. Uh, we said last week, when it comes to sexuality in your dating relationship, uh, you have two options. You can either sin together or you can honor God together. So if you want to have a marriage that is based on righteousness, then date based on a standard of righteousness. You don't build your marriage on a foundation of sin. And no matter what's happened in the past, you can say, from this day forward, we are going to honor God with our dating relationship, with our marriage relationship. If this is something that you messed up while you were dating, now you're married, and you say, well, is our foundation going to crumble? You can start today and say, from now on, we're going to honor God in everything we do. Uh, five pieces of advice to help you out in this area. Set your standards up front. Again, this is, this is for a dating couple, okay? Set your standards up front. When you meet somebody, maybe not right, right away the first, first time you meet, but certainly before it gets too late, you tell them that there are certain things you don't do. All right? You don't wait until you're in the backseat of the car to say, oh, this is as far as I go. All right? you, you set it up front and you say, this is, this is where my line is, and I believe that God wants us to, to not go beyond this line, so don't push me beyond that line. Uh, second one, keep four feet on the floor. All right? If you're watching TV or something like that, and your four feet are on the floor, you're, you're probably going to be safe. All right? It's going to be pretty awkward to get into trouble with four feet on the floor. All right? uh, once those feet come up onto your lap and you start rubbing her legs and you find out she doesn't have hair on her legs, things start to happen, right? Like your mind just starts to go. Uh, number three, keep everything buttoned, zipped, latched, twisted, and tied. All right? <laughs> keep everything done up. It's amazing how much easier it is to remain pure while you're dressed than it is when you're naked. Uh, number four, keep your tongue in your mouth as long as you can. All right, again, not saying that kissing is a sin, but things start to happen when you start kissing. Uh, I've, I've heard studies say that women, you, this may amaze you, but a man is ready for sex at the point of French kissing. Right? When you start French kissing, he's like, okay, let, we're good. Let's do it. Right? I know, men are microwaves, right? It's weird. Um, Craig Rochelle says that, you know, his hands are only satisfied doing this for so long, right? Eventually, his hands get tired, and they just do other things, right? <laughs> so keep the kissing to a minimum. No, oh, you're embarrassed. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> Last one I, I picked up from a youth leader. Uh, when I was a youth pastor, this is one of, the, one, of, one of the youth volunteers, and she taught it to the kids in her group, and it's always stuck with me. Keep your hands off the swimsuit. And what she meant by that was, don't put your hands anywhere a swimsuit goes, right? And I think that's really good advice. Uh, you could even take it a bit further and do like, you know, a middle ages swimsuit or something like that. But what, all it is saying is that if, if you're saying this is a line, you're not allowed to cross that line, the, the tendency, the temptation is to say, okay, well, let's see how close we can get to that line, right? And the wise thing to do is say, okay, if that's the line, then let's keep four feet on the floor. Let's keep our hands to ourselves. Let's, let's not go crazy with the kissing. Let's, let's wait and not let the foxes ruin our vineyard. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about how we catch the foxes in our marriage relationships, okay? Because it's important to protect our purity in all seasons, not just when you're dating. Uh, we, we don't want to get this idea of saying, we've got to be pure up until the moment you're married, and then you don't have to be pure anymore. That doesn't make sense. Uh, you need to be pure through all seasons. So this couple, they went through a season of preparation. They went through a season of infatuation. They pursued intimacy. They, they protected their purity. And now here's what the wife says about her husband in verse 16. She says, My lover is mine, and I am his. He browses among the lilies. Now there's a lot we could say about that verse. Uh, I'm just going to read it again. He browses among the lilies. That's in the Bible. You should read your Bible. There's good stuff in there. And look at verse 17. Before the dawn breezes, before the dawn breezes blow and the night shadows flee. What's she talking about? 
That's dawn, right? That's morning. What's she saying? She wants them all night long. Not all evening long now, okay? All night long. This is a husband and a wife. And because they've done all these things, they've done everything right, uh, they have this intimacy that's been developed. They have a foundation that's strong. And it means their sex life is good. Return to me, my love, like a gazelle or a young stag on the rugged mountains. This is the word of God. There's good stuff in the word of God. If you want what everyone else if you want what everyone else has, then do what everyone else does. But if you want what few people have, then do what few people do. Be willing to be different from everyone else in our culture. Seek Jesus first. Okay, just like me when, when, I, when, when Kathy came in my life, I wasn't seeking a spouse at that moment. I was seeking God. And then God brought us together. You're not seeking a spouse, you're seeking God, and you wait until he brings you what he wants you to have. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and then everything else will be added onto you. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up, and I'm going to pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you that, that you didn't shy away from these things, that you created uh, an amazing gift for us uh, in, in a marriage relationship, in relationships in general. And, and you gave us guidelines here on how to make sure that we stay healthy and pure in them. God, I pray for those who are dating right now. I pray that you help them to, to recognize that it is worth waiting, that winter is not a bad time to be in. I pray that you help them to grow in their relationship with you so that they can grow in their relationship with each other. God, I pray the same thing for those who are married, that, that our relationships with each other will grow because they're based on a foundation of, of being close to you. And Lord, I pray that you help all our marriages to be strong and healthy. We ask these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.